Hey everybody, my name is Rowan. Thank you for joining us. I say us because in person we have a group of people that's meeting as well. And together, those of you that are online, together we approach the presence of God. As a church family and friends of ours and those watching in today, welcome everybody. Let's do this together. Let's approach the throne of God together like the Bible says that we can do because of what Jesus has done for us. There's a promise in the word of God that says as we do this, as we open up our hearts to God, just each of us in our own way, as we say, God, I'm hungry. God, I'm wanting you. God, I'm, I'm asking you these things. I'm, I'm bringing myself before you. The Bible says as we do that, God himself draws close to us, to you and to me as we go through this together. So let's believe God for that. Let's pray and we'll get started. We're going to have a great time. We've got some worship, some praise and worship. We open up our hearts to God with music and song. And then we've got a kids component. And then we are going to dive into the last of the series that we've been doing on the end times, different things the Bible says about those things that are coming. A huge portion of scripture dedicated to a prophecy that has not yet been fulfilled yet. Some of it has, down to the letter, but then, the, then we're waiting. We're waiting for these things to take place, and there's signs that they are on their way. We're going to discuss that in a moment. Let's pray together, and we will go ahead and get started. Father, in the name of Jesus, we come before you now with the people around us, or if we're alone, God, we just engage you right now. Along with people that are watching online and in person, God, we come before your presence. God, we are asking you to come and to change us. We are asking you, God, to come and equip us. God, by your spirit, stir in us, we pray. Father, I thank you that we can encounter you like this and we can be changed by it in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. We'll be blessed. Praise God. Let's have a great time. Lord. 
our God, we lift up one voice. To our God, we lift up one song. To our God, we lift up one voice. Singing hallelujah. To our God, we lift up one voice. To our God, we lift up one song. To our God, we lift up one voice. Make his praise. Make his praise. Glorious. the barren places light to the darkest spaces God it's your nature 
You bring joy to the broken hearted hope to the ones who've lost it, God. It's your nature. There is no desert that your streams can run to. There are no ruins that your love won't make new. You tell the wasteland that it will bloom again. Cause it's your nature. You bring peace. To the war inside us, speak, and your fear is silenced. It's your nature. You bring joy to the broken-hearted home. To the ones who. It's your nature. There is no desert that your streams can run to. There are no ruins that your love won't make new. You tell the wasteland that it will bloom again. Cause it's your nature. shame has stolen. You keep the promises that you have spoken. I know this wasteland will be whole again. Is it your
Hello, boys and girls. Did you know our God is a good God and that he's always good? Welcome to the God is So Good series. In these episodes, we will be discovering more of God's character. That means who he is, what he's like, and how he does things. The Israelites called God by different names to tell about what he was like. Names like Jehovah Rohi or Jehovah Shammah. Each name of God shows a different side to his character. And it's always good. Most importantly, we will see how Jesus came to be an example of how God's good character still works for us in the New Testament as New Testament believers. God is still good for you and me. Come on, let's go. Hi, Karis. Hi, Rosie. Did you know that God is so good? Yeah. Yeah, we're, today we're going to look at one of the ways God shows us his goodness. Can you see what is behind you? Yeah. What's that? It's a calendar. It's a poster. And what does it say on the poster? God is so good. You got it. God is so good. And see all the numbers? Yeah. Every week we're going to take off one of those numbers and it's going to show us one of the ways that God is good. Can you find the number one? Yep. All right, take it off. And what does it say? It or says... What is it a picture of? It is a picture of a lamb and a shepherd's stick. A lamb and a shepherd's stick. And it says, Jehovah Rohi, the Lord my shepherd. So one of the ways that God is good is that he shows us that he's our shepherd. Can you say Jehovah Rohi? Jehovah Rohi. That's good. That's one of the names of God in the Bible. And Jehovah Rohi means the Lord my shepherd. Let's say the Lord my shepherd together. Lord the Lord my shepherd. my shepherd. Good. Now we're going to look at someone in the Bible who experienced God as their shepherd. Can you think of someone else in the Bible who says the Lord is my shepherd? David? Uh, yeah. Get that piece of paper right in front of you and open it up. And what does it say? David. It says David. Can you show everybody? Good. So we're going to look at David the shepherd boy and how God showed him what he was like. Thanks, Karis. Okay, everyone, let's say it together. Jehovah Rohi. Jehovah Rohi. Jehovah. Jehovah. Rohi. Rohi. The Lord my shepherd. The Lord my shepherd. All right, thanks. Hi, Spencer. Hi, Corey. How are you today? Good. Good. Do you know what a shepherd is? Yes, I do. What's a shepherd? It's a person who takes care of his sheep. Ah! And what does, how does he take care of them? What does he do? Um, he provides for them. Right. He leaves them in peace. And I can walk all of them. Right. He can walk all of them. Oh, yeah, so he protects them, eh? Hey? Yeah, protects and, them. And he, he leads them, is that what you said? Yeah, leads them. That's and pretty cool. And all kinds of things like that. That's neat. So, like, shepherds do a lot, don't they? Yes, they do. Yeah. Well, do you, are you familiar with David, the shepherd boy in the Bible? Yes, I like that story a lot. Yeah, I especially like the story about when that same David, he killed Goliath. Yeah. David. Who would know that the little shepherd boy would, would, would kill a, a whole big giant like Goliath? Yeah. That's amazing. David was a shepherd boy, a king, and the Goliath king. That's right. All right. So David was a boy who took care of his father's sheep. He was the youngest brother, and so as his older brothers grew up, they went to be part of King Saul's army, and David was left with the sheep. Yeah. He had a lot of opportunity to look after the sheep and learn how to take care of them really well, didn't he? Yes, he did. Yeah, like all those things you just mentioned. What were they again? What did he do for all those sheep? Provide for them. Provide. Give them peace. Give them peace. Mm. Protect them. Protect them, yes. And lead them, right? Yeah. Lead that, them. That's great. All right, so he took care of the sheep, and David learned as he did that, that God wanted to take care of him, just yeah. in the same way that he took care of his father's sheep. And as a matter of fact, he even wrote a song about that. Yeah. Do you know what, what song that is? Um, psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd. You got it. That's fantastic. 
All right, so David just understood how God was his Jehovah Rohi. Can you say that? Jehovah Rohi. The Lord his shepherd. Yeah. God had took care of David his whole life. He protected him when he fought Goliath. He guided him when he was king over Israel. And he gave him rest from all his enemies, too. He protected him. God was totally Jehovah Rohi to David. Wasn't that good of God? Yes, it was. He's hey. also Jehovah Rohi to us. You got it. Isn't he so good? Yes, he is. He's so good. Yeah. Amazing. More than you can imagine. That's great. Well, thanks for helping me tell the story, Spencer. You're welcome. Hello, Karis. How are you today? Hi, Tim. Are you good? Yeah. Oh, good. Hey, do you like my outfit? Yeah. It looks like a shepherd. Oh, good. That was exactly the look I was going for. And why do I look like a shepherd? Well, I'll tell you why. I'm here to tell you about one of the names of God, Jehovah Rohi, the Lord my shepherd. Can you say the Lord my shepherd? The Lord my shepherd. Good. Hey, do you see my name? Yeah. What does my name say? David. David. That's right. David knew that God was his Jehovah Rohi, the Lord his shepherd. And we can know God is our shepherd too, can't we? Yeah. Yes. Can you help me with the memory verse? Yeah. Great. It's John 10, 11. John 10, 11. I am the good shepherd. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd. The good shepherd. Gives his life. Gives his life. For the sheep. For the sheep. That's right. Okay, Jesus said that. And who are Jesus' sheep, Karis? Us. Us, that's right. And how did Jesus give his life for us? He died on the cross. Very good. You're so smart. Oh, perfect. All right, let's say it again, but how about we sound like little sheepies this time? Okay. Sure, you just have to say ba ba after each part of the verse. Okay. All right, John 10 11, ba ba. John 10 11, ba ba. I am, ba ba. I am, ba ba. The good shepherd, ba ba. The good shepherd, ba ba. And the good shepherd, ba ba. And the good shepherd, ba ba. Gives his life, ba ba. Gives his life, ba ba. For the sheep, ba ba. For the sheep, ba ba. Ah, oh, thank you. You make a great sheep, Karis. Thanks, Tim. Hey, Spencer. Hi. How are you today? Good. I, how about you? I'm great. I wonder what's in this beautiful chest. Well, I know it's something that reminds us about how good God is. Why don't you open it and find out? Yes, it would definitely be about that. I'm a little sheep. Oh, it's a little sheep. I'm a little sheep too. Two little sheep. Now, why ah. would sheep remind us about how good God is? We're sheep to God, and God is sheep, I mean, a shepherd to us. That's right. God is Jehovah Rohi, right? Yeah. Good. Wow, you're pretty smart, Spencer. Yeah, thanks. You are too. Thanks. So just like God was David's shepherd, Jesus is our shepherd today, isn't he? Yes, he is. Yeah. And what does it mean that he's going to do for us as our shepherd? Well, whatever a shepherd does, of And course. so what does a shepherd do? Provides us, gives us peace, leads us in the path of righteousness. Hey, you're saying Psalm 23, aren't you? Yes, yeah. I am. The Lord is my shepherd, and I shall not want that means he provides for us. Yeah. Yeah, he makes me lie down. And green he pasture. He gives us peace and green pasture. That means he, he makes sure we have enough to eat. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, stuff like that. All that kind of stuff. That's Psalm 23 that David wrote because he understood that God was his shepherd, right? Yeah, shepherds sure do a lot for sheep. They sure do. So if Jesus is our shepherd, how should we respond to him? Well, uh... Lots of ways. Yes, lots of ways. Do you know what I really mean when I say that? Mm -hmm. So if Jesus is our shepherd, do we ever need to feel afraid? No, we don't. How come? Because he... He protects us and he's always with us. Yeah. That's right. Just like the shepherd is for his sheep. Yeah. And if Jesus is our shepherd and the Holy Spirit asks us to give things away, will we ever have to be afraid that we'll run out and we won't have enough? We do not want to do that. Well, if Jesus asks, if God asks us to give things away, do we have to be afraid that we'll run out of things? No. No, why not? Well, because... Because our shepherd will provide, provide. for us. That's yes, right. Provide. Okay, and if you don't know what kind of decision to make, can we ask Jesus for help? Yes, we can, always. Why? 
well, because he leads us and guides us, right? Yeah. Just like a shepherd does. So now do you understand what I mean about responding to Jesus as Jehovah Rohi? Yeah. Good. And doing these things, boys and girls, is what it means to follow Jesus. And we follow him because we trust he will be our Jehovah Rohi. He will be our shepherd and he will care for us. And why will Jesus be our shepherd, Spencer? Because, because he is so, so good. good. That's Epic. Great. Amazing. <laughs> Perfect. Great. So can we say Jehovah Rohi, the Lord my shepherd, one more time? Good. Jehovah Rohi, the Lord my shepherd. Okay, boys and girls, you say it too. Jehovah Rohi, the Lord my shepherd. All right, thanks, Spencer. Welcome, Rosie. Well, boys and girls, now we know more about how good our God is. God was good to the Israelites in the Old Testament, and he's still good to us today. And remember, Hebrews 13.8 says Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And that means he's good to you, too. If you've never done it before, invite Jesus to be your Lord today. Just say, Jesus, come and be my Lord. Wash my heart clean and let me know your good plan for my life. And he sure will, because God is so good. Well, thank you, Mara and Kids Department, for that. Parents, remember, all those resources are online for you. Gatewayvictory.com slash kids. You can find it all there in prior uh, episodes and series and, and resources, downloadable PDFs, videos. It's all there. Uh, go ahead and enjoy. Well, praise God. I want to pray over our finances really quickly before we dive into our um, series on the end times, the last of our series on the end times. And... Um, I want to pray real quickly over our finances because many of you are giving and um, sending in finances, sending in your giving to the church, and, and I want to thank you for that. Thank you for your faithfulness in giving. Be reminded that our, our, your giving ties you to the economy of heaven, right? When you hit send on that e-transfer or when you drop something in the mail, or you give online, however you do it, that is actually a spiritual activity. It activates something spiritually. And so I want to pray over our finances. We've seen so many miracles, financial miracles over the last few years. Uh, we've seen so many financial miracles uh, in people's lives. And uh, I tell you, it's an adventure to follow God with your money. Not, you know, not just some, with some of your time or with some of your money, you know, but to follow him and to say, God, I'm, I'm open in every area of my life to what you want. And indeed, when we give to the Lord, it is an act of worship. It is worship that goes up before him. The Bible says like a, like a sacrifice that goes up, a well-pleasing sacrifice to God. Imagine that. Let's go ahead and offer him our hearts today and uh, pray along these lines with me. God, right now in Jesus' name, Father, we thank you for your faithfulness to us that, and your provision to us. God, we thank you so much that you have been faithful to provide in every area of our lives. And Father, we bring you our heart right now, our willingness to do with our money, with our finances, anything that you want us to do. God, many of us giving uh, directly and, and systematically to the church. God, I thank you that as your blessing is upon that. God, thank you that it ties us in with the economy of heaven and with the provision that you have for us. And so, Father, right now, in Jesus' name, we ask you for jobs and better jobs. We ask you, Father, for unexpected streams of income. Father, we thank you for these things now. We thank you for your provision over us in Jesus' name. Everybody said, amen. Praise God. It's good to pray over our money, isn't it? Hallelujah. Well, we've been talking quite a bit about the end times, about different things the Bible says about prophecy. Just one last time, by way of reminder, we're doing this so that we can learn a little bit more about what the Bible says about the things that are to come. 
right? I mean, this is a, this is a very in-depth topic, and we don't want to be overwhelmed by it. We just want to know a little bit more, and then a little bit more, and then a little bit more. And so I hope you've gotten some of these scriptures circled and outlined in your Bible. I hope you've taken some notes, and feel free to go back and get our prior services on this all the way through the month of July. But it's been good. It's been good for me. It's been good for your pastor just to study some of these things and to, and to look them up and to read what other people have said about them. But um, today, what I want to do is I want us to go to the book of Daniel in the Old Testament and look at some of the incredible prophecies that, ha- that were spoken through him about the things that are yet to come. So this is the book of Daniel in the Old Testament, and um, many of you know this, but Daniel was um, part of Israel, obviously, and uh, the, the Babylonians came and um, captured Israel and took them off into exile, and Daniel was about 16 years old when this happened, and he um, rapidly became um, a very, basically a government worker and a politician and a prophet in, um, in exile in Babylon, which is really, really quite something. Um, his life and his ministry spans the entire, uh, the entire 70 year period of, uh, of captivity in Babylon. And so this man was incredibly equipped by God to, to, see, to see visions and to experience an interpretation of them or interpret other people's visions. And it's really quite amazing some of the things that he came up with because like we've been saying, there are prophecies that have been fulfilled right down to the letter and yet not all of them. And so partway through, we're like, you know what? We're waiting for this next piece. It it hasn't happened yet. And as a student of scripture and as someone that follows the Lord Jesus Christ, we need to be aware that the Bible speaks expressly of things that are yet to come and what they may look like. And uh, of course, you know, it's, it's human nature, and I, I believe God wants us to do this, to, to, to put them on timelines and to f- try to figure out, God, what are you saying here? How is this going to happen? What is this going to look like, right? And, and, and it's important for us to do some of these things, but a word of caution on this. We must do it with a spirit of humility. We must do it with the, the willingness to be wrong, We must approach prophecy. We must approach these things with God. We we don't see it all clearly. And so God, show us what you want us to get out of this. And of course, through this whole series, we've been looking at this. These things are encouraging to us. These things give us a perspective and these things give us hope. And I believe that those things have been building in us as we've gone through this. I just want to make mention of this uh, before we look at Daniel. So If you look in, you don't have to go there right now, but if you look in Matthew uh, chapter 2, you see some prophecies that are outlined here about Jesus coming. And so prophecies from the Old Testament about Jesus and about what Jesus' origin would look like. And you can see in uh, in Matthew chapter 2, there's a prophecy about Jesus, about how how, how he would come out of Bethlehem. And there's a prophecy about Jesus, about, about how Ramah, you know, a small little town outside of Jerusalem, would be, um, would be instrumental in, uh, you know, would be uh, associated with, with the Messiah coming forth. There's a prophecy in the Old Testament about Jesus coming up out of Egypt. Interesting, right? I mean, it sounds contradictory. Is it Bethlehem or is it Egypt? And there's another prophecy about um, Jesus uh, coming up out of, of, out of Nazareth. Isn't that something? And so you can imagine, you know, being a student of prophecy before Jesus came, thinking to yourself, where and when is he going to come from? Like these, how is it that, you know, and and different people looking at these prophecies and saying, you know what, there's actually four messiahs, you know, or or other people looking at it and saying, you know, this is all allegorical. Like we don't, you know, these are all just like names of places that have deeper meanings. And so it's Jesus coming up out of this and, 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 and his origin being made up of that. You can imagine that there were students of Bible prophecy, you know, before these things actually took place that would be, that would be saying, you know what, um, it, it's not, you know, it's, it's allegorical. It's, it's um, uh, you know, the, there, there would have been some that would say that these things have already taken place. You know, Jesus came up out of Egypt. This is Moses. You know, it's the Messiah, Moses. It's the rescuer of God's people. That's what it's speaking about. I mean, it's already fulfilled. There's nothing left in this for us. 
You can imagine students of prophecy would have looked at those, those scriptures and would have been trying to piece it together. Maybe they put it on a static timeline. Maybe they drew charts and graphs and, and you know, tweeted it out there you know, just for other people to comment on. Maybe, maybe they had it all, you know, but if they weren't careful, they would have missed the real thing. When he came along, of course, we know this, you know, looking back, we know that Jesus was born in Bethlehem. And you remember why, right? That Caesar, um, you know, the, uh, wanted to take a census. And so, you know, so Jesus was born in Bethlehem. You know, Ramah was associated with Jesus' birth because it, 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 it is right outside Jerusalem. And Herod had ordered the massacre of the innocents, as it's called, trying to get rid of this one that was born king. And uh, you can see that that actually came true. You know where Jesus fled, don't you, with his parents to Egypt. And so then he came up out of Egypt and then being instructed by an angel not to go back to Bethlehem, went to Nazareth instead. And so Nazareth was Jesus' hometown. And boom, we have all these prophecies about the, the, the origin of the Messiah all lining up perfectly and being fulfilled down to the letter, down to a T, like precisely fulfilled. Although, can you see this with me? Looking from before it happened, it would be very difficult to imagine how that would happen. And looking back, yet looking back, precise, 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 precise. This is how it happened. And I, and I mention these things because as we look into the book of Daniel, you can imagine all the students of prophecy that have gone before us have tried to piece these things together to show when and how they're all going to happen. And I believe that we should. We should be students of these things. At the same time, with some humility. And at the same time, with some, you know, when we look back, when we're in heaven, new heavens, new earth, and we look back, we'll be able to see that all these prophecies were fulfilled down to the letter. And hear me, not allegorical, not purely just kind of picture language for some of the themes that are going to be part of the end time, but actually, actually happen the way that the scripture says that they would happen, even though we can't see clearly now how they're going to happen. These are prophecies. These are windows. These are pointers to those things that can happen. I hope that's clear. I hope you understand what I'm talking about here. Let's look at two different passages in Daniel, just for interest's sake and to say, Holy Spirit, stir these things in us. Some of you know, we're not going to get into the whole story here, but some of you know that Nebuchadnezzar, the Babylonian king in Daniel's time, had a dream, and then he insisted that his um, you know, magicians and sorcerers and, and people in the court, the wise men there, that they would, they would interpret the dream, not only interpret it, but state the dream to the king and then interpret it. And Daniel came forward. They couldn't do it, obviously. Daniel came forward and said, I'll do it. I'll do it. And he says this. Verse 28 of chapter 2, Daniel chapter 2, verse 28. Imagine the, the, the courage that this would have taken, Daniel. But there is a God in heaven, Daniel said, who reveals secrets. And he, has been, and he has made known to King Nebuchadnezzar what will be in the latter days. Your dream and the visions of your head upon your bed were these. As for you, O king, thoughts came to your mind while on your bed about what would come to pass after this. And he who reveals secrets has made known to you what will be. But as for me, the secret has not been revealed to me because I have more wisdom than anyone living. But for our sakes who make known the interpretation to the king, that you may know the thoughts of your heart. You, O king, and he begins this interpretation. Verse 31. You, O king, were watching and behold a great image. This great image whose splendor was excellent stood before you and its form was awesome. And this image's head was of fine gold and its chest and arms of silver and its belly and thighs of bronze, its legs of iron, its feet partly of iron and partly of clay. You watched while a stone was cut out without hands, which struck the image on its feet of iron and clay and broke them to pieces. Then the iron, the clay, the bronze, the silver, and the gold were crushed together and became like a chaff from the summer threshing floors. The wind carried them away so that no trace of them was found. And the stone that struck the image became the great mountain and filled the whole earth. This is the dream. Imagine, imagine King Nebuchadnezzar hearing this dream that he had had, that he didn't tell anybody. And here's Daniel speaking the dream. Now we will tell the interpretation of it before the king. Don't you think that 
Daniel had the king's attention. God had, had the king's attention at this point. Here's the dream that you had that you didn't tell anybody that you, that you know what it was. And now here's the interpretation. You, O king, verse 37, are a king of kings, for the God of heaven has given you a kingdom, power, strength, and glory. And whatever children of men dwell or the beasts of the field and the birds of heaven, he has given them into your hand and has made you a ruler over them all. You are this head of gold. But after you shall arise another kingdom inferior to yours, then another, a third kingdom of bronze, which shall rule over all the earth. And the fourth kingdom shall be as strong as iron inasmuch as the iron breaks in pieces and shatters everything. And like iron that crushes, that kingdom will break in pieces and crush all others. Whereas you saw the feet and toes partly of the potter's clay and partly of iron, the kingdom shall be divided. Yet the strength of the iron shall be in it, just as you saw the iron mixed with ceramic and clay. And as the toes of the feet were partly of iron and partly of clay, so the kingdom shall be partly strong and partly fragile. As you saw iron mixed with ceramic clay, they will mingle with the seed of men, but they will not adhere to one another, just as iron does not mix with clay." And in these days, the kings of the God of heaven will set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed and the kingdom shall not be left to other people. It shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms and it shall stand forever. Inasmuch as you saw that the stone was cut out of the mountain without hands and that it broke in the pieces of bronze, iron and bronze and the clay, the silver and the gold, the great God has made known to the king what will come to pass after this. The dream is certain and the interpretation is is sure. This is just absolutely amazing. For, for Daniel was prophesying future kingdoms that would come and denoted by the type of metal or the type of consistency uh, of, the, of the material, inferior kingdoms all the way down the line. We can look back through history and we can see this, that of course, King Nebuchadnezzar, he was the king of the Babylonian kingdom and that's already interpreted in the vision. And it says, but after you, shall arise another kingdom. How would, how would Daniel have known this except by the, the revelation of the Lord? It will be inferior to yours. This would, you know, scholars look back, historians look back and say, this was the Persian kingdom. And a third kingdom of bronze after that, Greek, the Greek um, empire. And the fourth kingdom shall be as strong as iron. Can you imagine what that was? It was in power when Jesus was when Jesus was born, a, a kingdom with the power of iron and breaking into pieces every other kingdom and every other, this is the Roman Empire, the fourth kingdom. And like iron that crushes, that kingdom will break in pieces and crush all the others. Now, verse 41 begins to say some things that we're not sure if it's past or not. We don't think so. It's not that super clear, but it's prophetic about some things that will come. <clears throat> Whereas you saw the feet and the toes partly of the potter's clay and partly of iron, the kingdom shall be, shall be divided, yet the strength of the iron shall be in it, just as you saw the iron mixed with ceramic clay. And historians and, and, and futurists look at this and say, how, when, where, what will this kingdom be? But the, the main point of this is this, that there shall be a kingdom. Verse 44, and in the days of these kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom. Jesus came saying the kingdom of heaven is here. The kingdom of heaven is here. Here is a kingdom that will break apart every other kingdom. As it says when he's um, telling the dream, it says that the stone that struck the image became a great mountain and filled the whole Earth. Doesn't that sound like the, the prophecy of Habakkuk where it says the knowledge of the glory of the Lord shall cover the earth like the waters cover the sea. What an incredible prophecy. Now you can join believers that have gone on before you to say, God, when will these things be? God, show us. And to take incredible encouragement from the fact that we are part of a kingdom that will never end, that will supersede every other kingdom. Let's go to Daniel chapter 12. Daniel chapter 12, this is, uh, well, the, uh, the title of it, not inspired scripture, but a title put in after the fact. It, it says it's the prophecy of the end time. Daniel chapter 12, let's look at this together. Isn't this amazing that there's prophetic scripture in here, partly fulfilled, some yet unfulfilled. God's stirring us what these things mean. Daniel chapter 12. 
At that time, Michael shall stand up, the great prince, who stands watch over the sons of your people. And there shall be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation. Do you remember in Matthew chapter 24, Jesus said that there shall be trouble that comes. That if it wasn't, you know, trouble um, that there has never been or never will be. All right, so it sounds a lot like that, doesn't it? Such as there never was, was a nation, even to that time. At that time, your people shall be delivered. Everyone who is found written in the book, and many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life and some to shame and everlasting contempt. Doesn't that sound like what we looked at in, in, um, in the book of Thessalonians where, where it says that we shall be changed, that the dead in Christ shall rise first. Let me read that again. And many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake. Here's like 600 B.C., prophetic literature, prophesying something that Paul said to the Thessalonian church. Give me a second here to find it. Thessalonians chapter 4. <clears throat> Do you not want you to be ignorant? Remember this? 1 Thessalonians 4. As those who are for, lest, lest you sorrow as those who have no hope. Verse 15, for this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who have fallen asleep or who have died. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout and the voice of an archangel and the trumpet of God and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And thus we shall also be with the Lord. Look at this. As many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life and some to shame and everlasting contempt. Those who are wise shall shine like the brightness of the firmament and those who turn many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. But you, Daniel, shut up the words and the seal, the book of the time to the end. Many shall run to and fro and knowledge shall increase. So you, Daniel, you're not of this season. You're not of this time. Shut these things up until the time of the end. And many shall run to and fro. Don't you think that's actually kind of true? You know, with transportation, that the way it is today compared to the way it was back when Daniel wrote this, many shall run to and fro and knowledge shall increase. You know this. They call our age the information age. Isn't that right? I mean, the, the, the increase of knowledge and the advancements in technology and science and in every single area of, of development, knowledge shall increase. Then I, Daniel, verse 5, looked and there stood two others, one on this riverbank and the other on that riverbank. And one said to the man clothed in linen who was above the waters of the river, how long shall the fulfillment of these wonders be? Then I heard the man who was clothed in linen who was above the waters of the river when he held up his hand and his left hand to heaven and swore by him who lives forever that it shall be for a time, times, and half a time. And um, people that study eschatology, the study of the end times, they say that this is a time, a time, and then half a time, right? For a time, times, and half a time. And the holy, and they, they, they allot the specific periods of time to this. It can be really quite interesting, especially when you match it up with verses in Revelation that seem to talk about the same kind of time periods. And when the power of the holy people has been completely shattered, all these things shall be finished. Although I heard, I did not understand. And then I said, <laughs> me too, right? And then I said, my Lord, what shall be the end of these things? And he said, go your way, Daniel, for the words are closed up and sealed until the time of the end. Many shall be purified and made white and refined, but the wicked shall do wickedly, and none of the wicked shall understand, but the wise shall understand. And from the time that the daily sacrifice is taken away and the abomination of desolation is set up, there shall be 1,290 days. That's pretty, pretty specific. Remember Jesus? He talked about the desolation, the abomination. The, he talked about the abomination of desolation. Remember Jesus talking about that? And you can see how there was a fulfillment of that in 70 AD. But this is perhaps talking about a future fulfillment of this, where the, the actual Antichrist will, it's like the man of lawlessness, as the Bible talks, and will set himself up in the temple of God. And from that time, from the time that the daily sacrifices is taken away, 
and the abomination is set up. There shall be 1,290 days, but blessed is he who waits and comes to the 1,335 days. But you go your way till the end, for you shall rest and will arise to your inheritance at the end of the days. What do these things mean? I believe that by the Spirit of God, we're meant to mull them over, meditate on them, and see them as God's prophetic, prophetic fulfillment, and go ahead and learn about them and, and figure out what other people have said about them and ask the Holy Spirit to reveal to you. I don't know, but I don't know about you, I want to be like Simeon who, who saw the Messiah, the infant Messiah, and he knew in his heart these things that were happening. I want to be like that, where I know in my heart what is going on and understanding the times that we are in. But like I said, I mean, we don't see it clearly. We have to put these things together as they happen and be encouraged by these things as they are spoken. I want to end these, this series with a passage in Revelation. Revelation chapter 12. And I know we're reading a lot of scripture here, but I want it to speak for itself. Remember, these are things that um, we can look into and see by the Spirit and be encouraged by. This is Revelation chapter 12. Now a great sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and on her head a garland of 12 stars. Then being with child, she cried out in labor and in pain to give birth. And another sign appeared in heaven, behold, a great fiery red dragon, having seven heads and ten horns and seven diadems on his heads. His tail drew a... His tail drew a third of the stars of heaven and threw them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman who was ready to give birth to devour her child. This is a messianic reference. As soon as it was born, and she bore a male child who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron. And her child was caught up to God and his throne. Then the woman fled into the wilderness where she has a place prepared by God that they should feed her there 1,260 days. War broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought with the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought. But they did not prevail, nor was a place found for them in heaven any longer. So the great dragon was cast out. That serpent of old called devil and Satan who deceives the whole world. He was cast to the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. And I heard a loud voice saying, Now salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ has come for the accuser of our brethren who has accused them before God day and night has been cast down and they overcame him by the blood of the lamb by the word of their testimony and not loving their lives to the death these things will come upon the earth and you and I will have a role and a part to play in them Praise the name of the Lord that he has seen fit to reveal to us aspects of this. Even seasons in which we can expect the fulfillment. Let us be encouraged. Let us be encouraged in our hearts that there is more that is yet to come. That there is a great and mighty victory that God is going to bring about for his people and for his name's sake. A great and mighty victory will be brought about for you and for me. A great and mighty redemption of all things, a new heaven and a new earth. Let us be encouraged. Let us have the perspective of one who knows that greater are the things ahead than those things are behind. Come on, let's have hope stirred in our hearts today to believe these things. Well, praise God. I hope that this series has whet your appetite a little bit to study it out more and to figure it out. Listen, look for encouragement, look for perspective, look for hope. Seek to understand just a little bit more as you go through these things. And church, let's do it with humility and let's do it with wisdom and let's believe God for these themes, for these major things to happen in our lives and in our future, to the future, in Jesus' name. Let's pray together. Church, can we do that? Father, we come before you now, awed that you have shared with us times and seasons, that you have given us clues and indicators about those things to come. God, we're awed by it, but I pray that by your spirit, we would be encouraged, that there would be perspective change, that there would be hope that would be stirred in us. Father, we believe you for these things, and God, we thank you for them. God, use us 
part of your bride, part of your church in the earth today to show forth your kingdom, we pray. In Jesus' mighty name, we ask you now. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. We'll be blessed, be encouraged, and walk with that new perspective and hope. Amen. Have a wonderful week. We'll see you around.